This is a Europhile review and rules run-through of Black Friday by Friedman Fries. Um, my version is a German version, Schwarzer Freitag. It's essentially language independent. There's a few little bits that, uh, that need translating, but very, very few. Um, Friedman Fries created Power Grid and a whole host of other games. He's a very prolific designer, but Power Grid is his most famous design and most sort of lauded design. This is a very good game and very underrated. It's a stocks and shares game. I think the cover hasn't really helped it because I, I'm not sure that everyone realises that the bull and bear is the sign of um, yeah, stock markets all around the world. Um, it's, it's a game about a crashing stock market. There's an inevitable decline in prices. Um, we've got this mention of a Wall Street Journal here. Uh, that's that's where this is is set, and it's a little more random than than a lot of other stock market games. Um, but it's quite exciting for that, knowing that there's going to be a crash. The major problem with this game is the rule book. The rule book is terrible. Really, really hard to understand. Hard to follow. The rules are all over the place. Some of them don't even seem to be in there at all. Lots of rules are explained in the sort of examples rather than in the actual rules themselves uh, and so it's a bit of a mission to actually learn how to play the game and for that reason I'm going to do an extremely detailed rules explanation rather than a brief overview like I would normally do. Um, if, you, if you want to skip the, the whole rules thing then I'll, I'll talk through my thoughts on the game at the end. I love this game, I think it's a real shame that it's it's been so criticised because of the rule book. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, that now means that quite a lot of places have it in stock and at a very reasonable price. Um, so you can pick up a bit of a bargain when you buy this game. And I've had a lot of fun with it. It's certainly the best stocks and shares game I've played for two players. And playing with two players, this works very well, where other stocks and shares games don't tend to. Um, but, but it also works very well uh, with three to five players as well. It plays within a reasonable time frame. It's lovely and tactile. Um, it's well worth a look. But let's have a look at uh, how the game actually works. I've set up the game. Um, it's almost completely set up. I'll show you the final couple of stages and I'll talk through briefly what I've done. So we've placed the game board um, we've got this token here, which people, this is one of the first confusing things about the game, people often wonder what this is. It's essentially a pretty um, irrelevant um, component, I don't really know why it's included, but the idea of it is that it gets placed into the black bag, and that's there to act as a reminder, so that when we have a price change, and we're going to feel that, and that's going to remind us to pay interest on any subsidies that we have. You can really do without that token. I don't really know why it's there, um, but th that's what it's for. We then place the five cylinders onto the space marked seven on the board here, and we're going to place the silver markers onto this space here at zero and this space at 20. This is the price of silver and this is a chart to show the price increases that may happen throughout the game or will happen throughout the game in fact. Um, we're then going to place two briefcases of each colour onto these tables over here. So I've done this already. Two yellows, two blues, two reds, two greens, two oranges and a black one on there. We fill up the spaces down here with black briefcases. We stack these different um, tiles in order over here on the Wall Street Journal, starting with start, then that backs onto one, two, three, and so on. I think it goes all the way up to nine. Yep, there we are, nine. Um, we've laid out the different subsidies. In my version, they're called subventions, but these are the subsidies, all the ones, all the twos and the fives. I'm playing a three-player version here, so I've got the two special action cards for players one, um, for players two and three. Player one doesn't get one. We've got the money laid out here, and then we have our player screens. I've um, put four of each color briefcase into the market. You'll see here that yellow is green. Blue is industry, red is cars, green is money, and 
orange is oil. You can forget that instantly because that will never come up again in the game. We've got a pile of silver and gold tokens over here and then comes the slightly more tricky bit which is putting the different bits into the black bag. Now for this you need to follow the table in the rule book. I'm playing with three players so I've put 13 of each colour into the bag. It's also, also worth noting that it's only because I'm playing with three players that there are four in here, four tokens in each of these spaces. Although that would be the same with four or five players, it wouldn't be the same with two. So there are 13 of each colour briefcase in here. What happens now is that each player draws five tokens out of the bag and places them in front of their player screen. So uh, they do this secretly so the other players can't see it. So these are the tokens drawn for player one. Uh, I'm going to go on and do this for each of the players uh, and I'm also going to draw randomly 20 briefcases from the bag and add them to the market. So here is the um, the screen for one of the players and you'll notice that I've drawn five of these stocks, these briefcases represent the stocks, out of that black bag and put them behind my screen. At the start of the game I don't start with any money so I'm only going to generate money by selling these stocks or by taking subsidies from the government which I, I never have to pay back so that's a great and slightly unusual aspect of the game but I will have to constantly pay interest on them every time that there are price changes in the market so having too many can start to affect your plan certainly if you can't pay that interest that's a significant problem for you. Um, so I have five of these uh, stocks in my supply as does every other player. I've also added um, 20 more stocks to the market and you'll see that random draw from the bag the majority of these have been green, red and blue. There are fewer orange and yellow stocks in the market so those stocks are scarcer which means they may actually be more valuable. There's more likely to be price changes that will increase the value of those stocks. Of course they may be behind the other players' player screens um, but as a player I don't know that I, so I can only really assume that they're going to be in that black bag so I'm not sure but they could be behind there or they could be behind there. Player 2 has been allocated one of these special action tokens. This one allows him uh, a pass, an extra pass on one of his turns. He can use it one time during the game. So let's place that over here. And player three is allowed either one pass or one sale of an extra an extra sale during the game. So uh, so he's got a bonus again. Now what this does is it takes away uh, or, or slightly mitigates the advantage of being first player because the first player doesn't have any of those special actions. Now what you can do during your turn in the game is you can do one action and that action can be to buy shares or sell shares or buy silver or pass. And in this game passing isn't strictly passing in the sense of you do nothing. When you pass in this game you actually have to place a briefcase onto the silver table which moves the game forward. So even if you're passing the game is moving forward because the pace of the game is dictated by how quickly the price of silver increases. An additional thing that I can do on my turn is I can always take government subsidies. Now there is a limit on how many I can take and that limit will change throughout the game but these subsidies if I took one subsidy it would be this one which is 20 pounds. Now I don't have to ever pay that back but I do have to pay the interest of one pound um, every time there's a price increase. So, so I'm gonna have to constantly pay interest on that but that is one subsidy. It's worth noting that this is not one subsidy, this is two subsidies. It's one tile but it counts for two subsidies and this is five subsidies. So you couldn't take this and say well I've just got one subsidy and, and so that just counts as one towards my limit. No that is five subsidies so it works very much like money in that way and you can 
get change. You know, if you, if you if you have five, then you can exchange that for two twos and a one, and, and so on. Now that's a mistake that I made in early games. Is that I thought that one of these tiles. Um, represented one subsidy, whether it was a value 2 or a value 5 or a value 1. So don't make that mistake. What we're allowed to do uh, during our turn is limited by what's on this token here. So in this first phase of the game, I'm allowed up to two subsidies. I'm allowed to buy or sell one share, one briefcase in my turn. I'm allowed to buy or sell one silver during my turn. And if there's a price change, this is how many briefcases will be drawn out of the bag. And I'll explain how that all works later. But the most important thing here is I can only buy or sell one um, uh, silver or um, briefcase, and I can only have two subsidies. Now this player has decided that he doesn't really want to be involved with these blues. He's got two blues here. But he knows that blues are really abundant in the market. He's not sure what's going to happen with that, so he's going to sell one of them. So what he does when he sells a, a, a stock is that he takes the stock and he places it into the market. So the blue is going to become even more abundant now. What he also has to do is take a blue from the sale table and remove that, also placing it into the market. Now this is important because as this table gets depleted, what's going to happen is eventually um, we're going to have a price change. Now there is a minor price change that happens here. Because we've sold a blue, the blue value drops to the left. So blue is down to value 6. But I sold it at value 7. So this player will now gain income of £7, which he will put behind his screen. This second player, um, he's decided he's going to get in early on the silver, because the silver is only currently priced at 20, um, because it's right at the start of the game. So he's going to take a subsidy, um, which is worth £20, so he instantly gets the £20, which I'll take for him now. So there it is, £20, and he puts this in front of him. Now he's going to spend that straight away in order to buy a silver. So he places the £20 back into the bank, and he takes a silver token. Now what he has to do is immediately place a coloured briefcase from the supply, from the market, and place one of those into the silver price table. Now, he wants to see red becoming a little more scarce, so I think he's going to place a red one into the market, into the, onto the silver price table, rather. So the red briefcase comes off and goes onto the silver price table. And as that table fills up, then that is going to cause price changes. There has been one purchase of silver, so we advance the silver purchase um, tracker down here. That goes up to one. If it gets up to three, then that is going to cause an increase in the price of silver. So we've covered selling. We've covered taking subsidies. We've covered uh, buying silver. So let's look at what happens if we buy a stock. So this third player is going to buy something. Now he's looking in a nice position because he's got three yellows behind his screen and he knows that yellows are fairly scarce in the market. So these are quite valuable to him. So he wants to hang on to those. Um, he thinks maybe he'll buy a bit more yellow. That might be a good way to go. So yellow is going to cost him seven to buy. Well, currently, he doesn't have any money, so he's going to have to take a subsidy. So he takes the first, the number one subsidy, £20, which comes straight to him, but he's going to spend seven of that in order to, um, to buy a uh, yellow. So he's actually only going to get £13. So here we are. 
13 pounds, and that will go behind his screen. What he does when he buys something is he takes a briefcase out of the market and puts it behind his screen. He also takes an additional one out of the market and places it onto the purchase table. And again, as this fills up, that's going to cause price changes to occur. So we're back to player one now, and we need to look at the fourth and final action that is available to us, and that's the action of passing. Now when you pass, you don't just miss your turn. What you do is take uh, a briefcase from the market and place it onto the silver purchase table. So this guy at the moment, he's hedging his bets really. He's got four different um, tokens of different types. So let's have a look at getting rid of an orange onto the silver table. So he takes an orange out of the market, he places it onto the silver table, and that is him passing. So we've seen that prices decrease when we sell um, stocks. They don't increase necessarily when we buy stocks but things get added to these tables over here, or taken away if we're selling. So let's have a little look at what happens um, and, and how price increases are triggered. So supposing that this um, purchase table up here had three briefcases placed on it of the same colour. Um, so three separate people have bought uh, yellow briefcases. That would cause yellow to increase by one, going to the right. Another way that, um, that yellow could increase going to the right would be if there was no yellow left in the market at the end of that purchase. That would also push yellow to the right. This is the same on the silver purchase table. So if there were three orange on here, then orange would move to the right. And if there were no orange left in the market, then orange would move to the right. So the prices increase as things become more scarce. Now, if either of these tables has five markers on it, then we get a major sort of price adjustment and we need to go through the whole process. So that would be true if it was on the purchase table, it would be true if we were on the silver purchase table. This is if there's five players, it needs one more token on there. But also a price adjustment occurs if um, there are only five coloured briefcases left on one of the sale tables. So if all of these had been removed um, because of various sales that had taken place, then a price adjustment would occur. We ignore the black briefcase on the end for this purpose. Okay, so let's have a little look at how that price adjustment actually happens. We'll imagine that we have a situation like this one here, where the sales table has been completely, the purchase table, sorry, has been completely filled up to, to five. So a price increase is going to occur. Now this is probably the most confusing part of the game and the place where you're most likely to run into trouble um, which can affect the, the, the way the, the game works. Um, so what we do at this stage is that the player who triggered the price adjustment uh, takes briefcases out of this black bag, the ones that were placed in there at the beginning of the game, and they take a number of briefcases equal to the number on this card here. So they're taking five briefcases out of the bag. So let's do that now. So there's one, two, three, four, little fluff, and five. Now while diving about in that bag, um, I uh, also felt this. So this reminds me that we must play, pay interest on our subsidies that we have at the moment. Uh, now this player doesn't have any subsidies, but the other two players both have one subsidy each. So with one subsidy, they're going to need to pay one pound in interest at this point. So let's imagine both of them pay a pound in interest, 
and then we come back to looking at these briefcases which are going to adjust the prices. So we have three yellow briefcases. That's quite significant for yellow. Um, so what we do is we look at this chart here. And we say three. Right, so three, we're going from this grey space in the middle. Three is two up. So yellow is going to increase vertically by two. OK. Now, red and orange each have one briefcase pulled out of the bag. So one is one space up from the grey space. So red and orange are both going to increase vertically by one. There we go. So we've had a significant price change here. These tokens now will all go into the market. So there's three more yellows in the market than there were before. And there's one extra orange and one extra red in the market. The briefcases that are on the table over here, they go into the bag. So we now know that yellow is a little bit more abundant in that bag. So they're going in here. And that's going to have an impact later. Now, we've changed level. This is level one, this low green level here. Sorry, this is the start level. This is level one, this dark green line running along here. So orange is now in there. But this one has gone up into level two. So we've skipped level one altogether. And this means that this bag, this um, start token well, we've skipped level one, so we're now on to level two, which allows five subsidies, two purchases or sales, two purchases of silver, and next time six briefcases will come out of the bag. The other thing that happens is we now get rid of level one and level two briefcases, these black ones, that get put in the bag. Now, these black briefcases are bad. They're going to be the things that are going to bring on significant price drops and ultimately bring on the inevitable sort of crash that we're working towards in this game. We know there's going to be a crash in this game and it's the black briefcases that are going to do it. Now the way that the black briefcases work is that if I pulled out, let's have a look, let's imagine another price, price change. So if I pulled out this uh, and then let's say that there were a couple of black ones in the mix this is later in the game. And what these black ones do is they negate the, uh, the effects of the other ones. So they count as minus one. So yellow is at zero. Blue is at zero. Green is at minus one. Red is at minus two. And orange is at minus two. Now, I didn't mention this previously with the previous price adjustment, but if zero bag, um, uh, briefcases come out, then those prices are adjusted also. So let's look here. Zero is to the left. So anything that was at zero would move to the left. So I think that was blue and green previously would have moved to the left. Now, looking at what we've got here now, we've got zero for blue and yellow. So they move to the left. We've got minus one for green. So minus one means it moves down that way. Well, it can't do that, so it's going to have to go left. Uh, red is on minus two. So minus two is down and left. So red's going here and here. And orange is also on minus two, so that's going down and across. And uh, I think that's it. So that's price adjustments when black ones come out. And obviously the more black ones that come out, the bigger those crashes are going to be. And as you can see, the higher we go on the levels, the more black briefcases are going to come off this portion and go into the bag. Also, the more that are sold we're going to start putting in black briefcases from here because when this table is completely 
empty, you know, when there's five, have got five left on here, we're going to have a price adjustment. All of these are then going to be put into the bag, including that black one. And on the second sale table, once this one's empty, there's going to be two. On the third sale table, there's going to be three black ones going into the bag. And that all increases the chances of crashes um, happening. The other thing that black briefcases do is that if only one of them is taken out of the bag, then it's placed back in. Okay, it doesn't have an effect. It only has an effect if we have two or more black briefcases taken out of the bag. However, that single black briefcase will increase the price of silver by one. So even if just one black briefcase comes out, the price of silver will go up by one. If two came out, as we saw there, then it would increase the price of silver by two. And bear in mind that if this was along here, so it was on three or it was on six, then that's going to increase it by more. So silver is going to get more and more expensive throughout the game. And the winner at the end of the game is not the person with the most money, it's the person with the most silver. And five silver is always converted into gold. So gold just counts as five silver. So you want to get the silver while it's cheap. Um, but that's not easy. That's, that's not easy to do um, because you also need to be manipulating the market in the early stages in order to afford enough to buy plenty of silver to beat your opponents. Like many uh, Friedman Freeze games, the game ends at a set point, which is when the silver price reaches a hundred. So that game end is it's kind of a race to get it there, to get to 100. If you can be the person who pushes it up there while you're in the lead, then you're going to win the game. And that's a common feature in a lot of Friedman Freeze's games, is this kind of pacey um, finish. And it's about knowing when to get out of the market, when to sell all your stuff off because you can see an inevitable crash, and instead start investing in silver, which never reduces in price, only ever goes up. I want to just clarify a couple of rules because I want this to be a really thorough rules explanation because I know people have had so many problems with the game. Um, so a couple of minor, well they're not minor actually, they'll make a major difference to the game uh, rules. Currently, say we were on stage six of the game um, because the price had increased so far up here that we were at stage six and you were allowed to buy or sell up to four um, briefcases. Well if I bought four briefcases then I, I would put them behind my, my screen, but I wouldn't put four on here, I would still only put one. And I can buy a mixture of different colours of briefcases, so if I chose to take two green and two orange, then I could choose either to put green or orange onto this chart. If there were no green or orange available, I could choose to put any colour onto that chart, but if I can put one of the colours of, of one of the ones that I've bought on there, then I have to. The same sort of thing happens when I'm purchasing things. So um, if I was, for example, to... Uh, sorry, when I'm selling things. So if, if for example, I was to sell um, uh, an orange, so the orange comes from behind my screen and goes into the market, I then have to take an orange off the table here. Okay, if there are no oranges on that table, then I could take a different colour. Uh, and, and so essentially, you know, you, you try and match the colours with what you're doing, but if you can't, then you can use an alternate colour. Now, this also affects that minor sort of price shift that happens when you sell something. So if I sold an orange and a green, uh, then only one of them decreases in price and I can choose whether that's orange or green. So I might choose to decrease the orange in price because I don't want the green to go down too much more. Um, so that's a significant part of the game that it's worth understanding. Another thing that I think I need to just briefly talk through is the use of subsidies. If you cannot pay back a subsidy when you're asked to do so, then that's sort of okay. Sort of. You don't want to do it too often. But you flip the subsidy over uh, to show that it hasn't been paid. Now you must pay it off on your next turn. And that's going to mean either selling stocks to do it, taking out further subsidies in order to do it. Um, but if you don't do it, then you're going to be bankrupt and you're going to be out of the game.
Now, I've never seen that happen, um, but I have seen people get to the position where they can't pay it, and on their next turn, they're going to have to do some fairly drastic things in order to pay off this subsidy to make sure that they can carry on playing. So that is also something to be aware of in the rules. Another element of the rules which, uh, which I think you need to know is that if red, for example here, was pushed to the left, it's going to go down. So if it goes to the left and it can't go any further, it's going to go down. Equally, if it was pushed to the right, it's going to go up. And that's what these arrows are all about. Okay, and that can make quite big significant changes in the price. So it's worth spotting when that's likely to happen. Another important thing to notice is that at the end of every price adjustment, this token here is going to reset back to zero so that the silver purchases can start building up again. So this only ever charts how many purchases there have been between each price adjustment. And that's important, and I think if you, if you didn't do that, that's going to create problems in the game. So what are the common mistakes that people make when they play this game? I would say probably the most common thing is forgetting that when those black bag, those black briefcases come out of the bag, that the silver price increases one for every black bag that comes out. I think that's very easy to forget. Uh, and that has a significant impact on the game because the silver price will get to a point, um, but it won't rise any further. All the prices will crash and you'll find that the game will never end. And uh, that seems to be a common complaint is that this game never ends. If you play it correctly, I think it does end and the pace is very good. It's if you get one minor rule wrong, that changes. Be aware of this thing about subsidies. These, uh, this counts as five of these. Okay, it's equivalent to five of these. This is not one subsidy on its own, and that's a mistake that I made. Um, you've got to really, really try and get your head around that price increase process. Um, and there's, there's lots of nice flow charts and things like that on BoardGameGeek that can help you with that. Um, but it's not immediately obvious how these things work. Um, the, the, the use of those, those tables, those sort of sale tables and purchase tables up here, you know, recognizing what happens when you buy silver, that one something's got to come out of the market and go onto that table, um, and the use of those black briefcases. There's lots of scope for confusion here. Okay, but essentially, if you you know really follow those player aids, um, it very quickly starts to come together and starts to feel quite natural. Black Friday is uh, it plays in about an hour. Um, it plays well with two players, it plays well with up to five. Um, there's a lot of fun in it, there's a lot of excitement in it because it's got that slightly random element to it of that drawing out of that bag. Um, but it doesn't feel like random randomness overpowers all the strategy in the game. There's a lot you can do to make sure that you get the right colours into that bag to ensure that your stocks are going to increase in value. Uh, and other people's stocks are going to decrease in value. But knowing that there's a looming crash um, is, is very sort of um, exciting and tense. Um, it's, it, it's a really good game. It's, it's been overlooked, um, I, I think, and, and it's a shame. I, I enjoy Friedman Free's games. I, I really like the way that he um, takes an existing genre and existing mechanics within that genre and reworks them and twists them. And this feels very different to other stocks and shares games that I've played. I recently did a video of um, Harbin Gut. Harbin Gut, I think, is probably my favourite stocks and shares game. It's absolutely fantastic. But this game relies on card play um, to manipulate the, the stocks and shares. Um, and uh, as does uh, Mercurius, which is another similar title, which is also very good. But this idea in Black Friday of the um, sort of pulling those little tactile pieces out of a black bag, that's fantastic, you know, that, 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 that's different. Um, and, and I enjoy that, the fact that there's a different approach to that sort of genre. Um, I think it probably has most in common with the... It's hard to say, actually, that it has a great deal in common with 18xx, but I think 18xx certainly has had some uh, 
it has been an inspiration for um, freezing creating Black Friday that would be my guess um, in Black Friday you get the the horizontal movement of the, of the share prices as well as the vertical movement you don't get that in Harbin Goot you don't get it in Mercurius but you do get it in the 18xx games and that's an added level of strategy and complexity to the game you also get the phases um, the, the, in, in Black Friday, you know, you go through phases where certain things are allowed, they're not allowed in the next phase, or, or more like actually you're allowed to do more in the next phase, um, and those phases depend on the, the stocks hitting a certain, a certain value. You know, in 18xx, you know, the, the first purchase of a certain train, or in Poseidon, that I show you there, a certain ship, that's going to um, allow you to do more in your turn. Um, and so, so again, that feels like it's been some sort of inspiration to Freeze in this. Um, I enjoy a lot of Fried Friedman Freeze games. First and Feld is another one that includes a simple um, commodity speculation sort of chart on it. This is much, much simpler than Black Friday, um, but it does have that sort of stops and shares sort of chart on there and you're buying and selling. Um, this is uh, a sort of... Um, reworking of the, the deck building genre and the sort of reversal of it. A very clever game, um, much, much lighter and, and uh, simpler than, than, than Black Friday. Not that Black Friday is complex at all. I love Power Grid. It's one of my favourite games. But I also like the other games in the, the series. Fa Factory Manager is a decent little uh, engine building game. Um, and First Sparks is a lovely, um, sort of slightly... I hesitate to say lighter, but a, a shorter um, uh, version of Power Grid with very similar mechanics. And then Copycat was his, uh, his big box game last, last year at Essen, which again re-examines sort of what you can do with that deck building mechanic and introduces worker placement into it. So Freeze games are always worth a look, but um, unfortunately Black Friday doesn't seem to have sat so comfortably with, with a lot of players. And, I think that's mainly because that rule book is so terrible. So uh, this is why I've gone into such detail in that rules explanation. Um, because you know, it took me a while, it took me a few plays to get all those rules right. But once I did, you know, I enjoyed those early plays where I was getting the rules wrong. But once I got the rules right, everything fell into place. The pace picked up, and uh, and and the game really, really does work. So um, see if you can find it. You'll probably find it at a, a decent price because uh, I doubt sales are particularly great, <laughs> largely based, uh, I think, on that terrible rule book and also the, the odd um, picture of the bull and the bear on the front cover, um, which makes it look like some sort of um, animal combat cartoon. Yeah, I don't know what it looks like, but it doesn't look like a stocks and shares game to me. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you like this sort of game, this is a good example of it, and I'd say get yourself a copy. That's Black Friday.